Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 10. Yeah, they say I am. I want to read verse 23, just to one verse of scripture. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. All things are lawful for me. But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Today, I just want to share with us. I want to talk about our courage to uh, produce a different result. Amen. Producing a different result. That's what I would just, just want to talk about. Producing a different result. Amen. Producing a different result. Now, this scripture is very common, and um, there's another place in the Bible. It talks it's the same thing in chapter 6. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Now, one of the fundamental errors of making decisions that I have discovered is that most times when we want to decide, make decisions, we always consider things from right and wrong. And oftentimes people will ask questions, is it right for me to do that? Or is it wrong for me to do that? Which suggests that if it is wrong, then I'm not going to do it. But if it is right, then I will do it. So our decision becomes a yes or a no, a good or evil. Is it right? Is it wrong? And most things in our life, we just base it on that. So everything we want to do, we just ask question, is this thing right for me or is this thing wrong? And sometimes even Christians, we basically judge from evil and good. So we just want to know, is this evil? Or is this good? Is this a bad thing to do? Or is it a good thing to do? So sometimes you're counseling with people and people will say stuff like, you know, but is it, is, it, is it a bad thing that I have done? Or is it a good thing? So it becomes a defense. Because when you've done something and you really think what you've done is good, then it becomes a defense. So if somebody questions it, then you will say things like, have I done anything wrong? Or is it bad what I have done? I'm very sure many of us have made that statement before. Is it bad? What, what, is, what is bad in what I have done? But I want to take you beyond that a little bit and to tell you that uh, it is one of the most, it's, it's, it's a very low level of making decision. If all your decision has to be based on good or evil. It's like somebody comes to me and say, Pastor, is it right for somebody to do X, Y, Z? I, I, I struggle to give you an answer of a yes or a no because it's still small. It's not sufficient to answer the questions of your heart. And, and then after that, it doesn't mean you're really going to move forward with doing something significant. I want you to follow me closely. So you see, everything about life is not about right or wrong. Everything about right is not evil and good. Everything is not about that. Let me just say this before I go on, and I've said this statement many times for people who are familiar. Now, listen to this. Not everything that is good is God. Listen carefully. Not everything that is good is God. Everything that is God is good. But not everything that is good is God. You need to get that very clear. Because if it's, that's not clear within you, you will live a life of sentiments. You will live a life of trying to please people. You will be harassed. You will be pushed. Somebody's going to make you look bad sometimes, even when you're doing what is right. Somebody is going to make you feel bad because, you know, human beings judges everything from good. Anything that is good is God. You know, giving arms to the poor is good. You know, let me get an example. There's one funny thing that happens. You know, there was a time in church, this, our coffee morning food bank, we would give people lots of food. So when they come, we don't verify. It's not our policy. We really don't want to do that. And we still don't do that. So if you say you're hungry, you just get food. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but it's basically on Tuesdays. And then we discovered after some time, we thought to ourselves, we discovered that some of these guys, they collect money from government enough to feed them. Are you following me? But the food that we give them on Tuesdays, it's so massive. These guys don't pay rent. They didn't do all that. So that means all the food you give them is sufficient for them to live for a week. Now, the meaning of that is this. 
you are indirectly giving them license to use the money they collect from government to smoke, to take alcohol, and to do all that. Now, now, somebody with, if someone's mind is small, the person will say, well, it's a good thing, just give them everything they want. No, it's not good because it's not God. And even if you think it's good, it's not God. So decision making goes beyond sentiment. So what we have to do, and then also, you know, some people will come with their spouse, and so the wife will collect, the dad will collect, and then somebody will say, oh, my friend also, they will collect, and then people who come on Tuesdays will notice this. Now, then we reduce the food, the quantity of the food, such that it will not be sufficient to carry you and then spend all the rest of your money on drugs and alcohol. You know, basically because the people we deal with most times are people who are trusting the Lord to leave cigarettes alone, trusting the Lord to stop drugs, trusting the Lord. You know, so those are the people we deal with 100% on Tuesdays. Now, but then we cut that down because even though it seemed good, in fact, the truth is it wasn't even expensive to do. But the point is, at the end of the day, is that the will of God for their life. Are we actually helping them or destroying them? So we bless them. And then the blessing now increases their appetite for drugs and alcohol because now they can use all their money for that. Follow me closely. You get to a level in life where you, it's not just sentiments that guides your decision. If the people will push you here and there, you, you would, somebody will tell you, it, that's what is good to do. But it might be good and not God. I might not feel led to do it. I, it might not be what God is telling me to do. Praise the Lord. So you don't do everything good. Or oh, that is good in the eyes of men. This is really shocking to many of us right now. But you need to get this clear. Because if you really want to please God, you need to get out of sentimental things. You need to get to the level of doing what is right. You see, I always tell people this. It's either I speak to you the old truth or I don't talk at all. So if you, if you deal with me and I'm 100% quiet, just know that there are things that need to be said, but the environment is not conducive. I'm just going to be dead quiet because there's no need to lie to people. There's no need to be sentimental. There's no need to deceive people. And so in making decisions for life, get this clear. I want to say this, and this is, this is, maybe a pastor shouldn't be saying this. Do you know, it is not every time that God wants you to give to the poor. Say, but it's very good. But I just gave you an example where giving to the poor too much can wreck their lives. So God might tell you, you know what, don't give that person 100 pounds. Even though he says he needs 100 pounds, give him five quid. So that his brain can walk and that is God but when human being judges the matter you are devil but you see it really doesn't matter what human being says what matters is the principle of God that you're doing what is right and is helping people oftentimes the things we do to help people are the things that destroy them And therefore, always tell people, don't be God to any human being because then you're causing God to be envious. Don't put yourself at the level in people's life whereby they can rely on you instead of relying on God. You're taking the place of God. No, listen to this. By all means, do good work. By all means, look after people. By all means, do everything that is right. But if I need to depend on you instead of depending on God, you're doing me no good. You're doing me a lot of harm. Because you're not going to allow me to, to, to free myself to depend on God for my own life simply because you can always step in and be God for me. Don't be God for people. That's not being good. That's not the goodness of the Lord. Don't be God for people. Sometimes it's gross arrogance. It's arrogance for you to even think that you are always there for them. You're not God. You're not omnipresent. You can be always there. Not deliberately, but it's not a big deal if I fail you sometimes because I'm no God. It, 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 it's important to grab this. I'm going somewhere, don't worry. 
It's important to understand this so that your dealings with God is not sentimental. It's not being pushed. It's not do's and don'ts. Go there, don't go there. That's evil. That's God. That's that. No, 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 no. Life is more than all those simplistic way of thinking. There are more. There are more. So, so, so all I've said so far is simple. Not everything that is good. Can you finish it? Not everything. But if it is God, it's always good. Hallelujah. Sometimes when you understand this, you might look ruthless sometimes. So you might say, I see you don't have feelings. No. It's simply because you are not living a life of sentiment. You are living a life of truth. Truth and sentiment, they're not the same. And it takes a lot of courage to live this kind of life. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to live this kind of life. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage. Because then you have to be ready that some people are going to call you wicked. You have to be ready that some people are going to call you arrogant. You have to be ready that some people are going to say you're confused. You have to be ready that some people are going to misunderstand you. You're going to be ready for all that. But if you grasp what I'm talking about, you don't even care about that. Now, don't get that wrong. I don't mean you don't care about what people say, but it's irrelevant what people say if it negates what God is saying about you. Are you following what I'm saying? So you, you need to understand this. So it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage. Without even, you know, straight away, if we just go into the scripture, you will discover that a lot of people in the Bible, it took a lot of courage for them to be able to produce a different result. Figure to Numbers 12, 13, there about. Now you will discover, you know, when, when the children of Israel went with 12 elders to spy the land, they saw the sons of the, the giants. They saw everything. But 10 of them came back and they said, we are not able to go and possess the land. This land is so dangerous. It consumes the inhabitants thereof. Now there's something that is amazing in that story. Because these same people, they came back with the fruit. And the giants didn't destroy them while they were getting it. They came back with those things. They saw the fruit of the land. Listen to this. It's not about seeing it. It takes courage to really step into the fullness of God wants you to do in life. Weaklings don't get results in life. People who are, now, like, like I say this all the time, I'm not talking about physical strength. I'm not talking about muscle, not six pack, not even eight pack. You can have all that and be a coward. I'm talking about the strength of mind. I'm talking about mental prowess, mental capacity, mental strength. You understand that it's not just based on your ability, but based on the power of the Holy Spirit and the workings of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. I'm talking about that mental strength, the inner man. Where the Bible says that may the Lord strengthen you in your inner man. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of anointing that was on Jesus Christ. When the Bible says he had, he, 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 he had the spirit of mind. Mental strength. I want to challenge you today. There are so many things you can do. There are so many things you can make happen. You can change the course of your life. You can make something different, something new. You can create a time of refreshing in your own story if you are courageous to take steps that others won't take and do stuff that other people will not do. It is impossible to do the same thing with others and expect to have the same results. You know that very well. And somebody defined madness as doing the same thing all over every time of your life and expecting to have the same different result. It's important. It's important. And, and this thing I'm telling you goes in every area of life. You can't change anything about your health until you're ready to do something. You can't do anything about your finances until you're ready to do something. God isn't a magician. And the, the grace of God is not available so that we can become lazy. No. Paul said that his grace upon me is not in vain. I labor more than them all. I labor more. Grace causes you to labor more. But the beautiful thing about it is that he empowers you to do it effortlessly. Because then he said, but yet not I, but the grace of God which is working inside of me. 
So this grace is not some kind of what some other charlatans preach and just tell you, you have the grace of God, you can do whatever you like. Listen to this. Anybody who can do whatever they like, they are loose, they are without restraint. Liberty is not the capacity to do whatever you like. Liberty is the ability to choose within the boundaries. That's the truth. So you need to be courageous to produce a different result. But then the Bible talks about Joshua and Caleb who had a different spirit. And they looked at Moses and they said, we are able to go on and do it. Because God is on our side. I want to challenge you today. You need a different spirit to produce a different result. I repeat that. You need to operate with a different spirit to produce a different result. For instance, we live in an environment where there are basic, basic fundamental belief system about marriage. And it's, it's not strange that everybody, just a little bit after some time, would follow. Would follow, you, you see? Uh, because it is normal for people to respond to, to the predominant belief system around them. It's, it's, it's normal for people to respond to, the, to their cultural interpretation, for the, to respond to the things that are around them. And so... You live in the UK, you behave as you're in the UK. Let me just tell you this, this is very important. One of the most difficult things for any human being to do is to be delivered from the power of traditions. Very difficult. It takes a lot of courage. I'll just give an example. Many times, quite a number of us here are from, not originally from this country. So you're from maybe Zimbabwe or Nigeria, okay. Now, somebody comes from Zimbabwe and then he says, the traditions of Zimbabwe, I don't like the traditions of Zimbabwe, so I'm delivered. I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God, I'm not going to do all those things that our forefathers have been doing, I'm not going to do all that, and indeed they're not doing it. But you see, if you're a careful student <laughs> of human behavior, if you, if, you, if you look at what people do, I have discovered that over 90% or more of such people have just been delivered from Zimbabwe tradition to imbibe the British tradition. And so you are still bound. You see, why you think you're not bound is because something suggests to you that the British tradition or custom is superior to your own. Another level of slavery. Genuine freedom is to be free from all traditions of man. Whether I'm in Nigeria or I'm in England or you are British, it's completely irrelevant. I don't want to behave like a British person. I don't want to behave like an American. You know what? I don't want to behave like a Nigerian. I just want to behave like a child of God. The meaning of that is anything that is good about being a Nigerian, I will never drop it. And anything that is good about being a Chinese, I'll embrace it. And everything that is good about being British, I will embrace it. And no matter what my parents do, if it's bad being in Nigeria, I'll drop it. And if I live in England for the rest of my life, I'll still drop it if it's not working. That's what it means to be delivered from the traditions of men. But it takes a lot of courage. It's going to be pushed here around there to follow the status quo. Let's have this familiar case study, which I've, I've spoken about sometimes last week, I think about twice, but in a different way. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 to 14. I was discussing in our grace chat room, you know, with someone to remember in a different way. Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, 8 to 14. 8 to 14. It's actually from beginning to the end of the chapter, but it's just to help us. So I've, I just want to read a few verses. I might not even read all that. I'll probably just read the 8 because you're very familiar with the scripture. But if you're writing, write Daniel chapter 1. That's everything. Daniel chapter 8. The Bible says, but Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacy, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, you need to have a bit of background to this, and you, I'm very sure you're familiar with this. The children of Israel are in captivity, and then the best of them were selected. Selected because they were handsome or beautiful, 
and also selected because they were very, very intelligent. Are you following me? So, handsome and intelligent people, or beautiful and intelligent people were chosen to stand before the king. Let me say this. This is important. Natural decisions, who you are, your talents, your gifts, all those things will work for some time. Will work for some time. All those things will work for some time. All those things will, will work. But there is a level you get to in your life that you will need more things to generate more results. You will need more things to produce a different result. So you see, there are levels of your life you will get to because you're intelligent, you're smart, you're great. But I have discovered that many people fail in different aspects of life because their ability or capacity cannot deliver results in that area. In other words, you can be the best in, your, in understanding health and be rubbish in your finances. You can be the best in finances, but you're not good enough to do something else and, and so on and so forth. You've seen the most intelligent people that they can handle their marriage. You've seen people who can handle their marriage. They can handle their children. People who can handle their children, they can handle their finances. Because listen to this, whether you like it or not, there are results in your life that you cannot produce on your own strength. There are results in your life that you need this, this extra, this power, this anointing, this grace of God. There are results in your life. And I see a lot of people, why we are limited is because every result we produce is based on our ability. You might be doing very well and in fact massively well, but what you don't know are the things that are waiting for you if you're able to operate with the power and the grace and the anointing of God. Because sometimes our deception is the, is the result that we already have, the result that we already have, the things we have to show, the abilities, what our abilities has given to us. I became all these without trusting any God. You might just be right, but I want to tell you, there are things you will not be able to get without God. And I'll just say the most simple one, what shall he profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own? Because there's no human ability or capacity that can introduce you to the eternal power and presence of God and to be with God for all eternity. It's not possible. That's one massive limitation. Are you still following me? So Daniel proposed in his heart. He would not defile himself. He was chosen because he was handsome. He was chosen because he was intelligent. We shared Rock Meshach and Abednego. They were chosen because they had something to offer. They wouldn't be there. Now, I'm saying that because sometimes when people want to become lazy, they say, it doesn't really matter what I know. No, it does matter what you know. That's not what I'm saying. He said, it doesn't matter. You know, I can be anything. God spoke to me in the middle of the night to appear, to, uh, to, to apply to be the MD of Microsoft. Oh, no, just, just come down a little bit, okay? God doesn't necessarily break protocols the way you expect him to break protocols. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you should, don't do anything. It doesn't matter who you are. You know, it can be anybody. No, that's not what we're saying. That's negligence. That's carelessness. That's recklessness. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is this, that God is important for you to, to develop yourself. It's important for you to have something to offer. But you get to a level where you know that the things that you have to offer is not even sufficient. Let me show you this. Follow the story. Now, it's not only that it's not going to be sufficient for God, but it's also not going to be sufficient for man. Because what happened to these four boys was simple. After they called them and they were chosen to stand before the king, the Bible said they needed to be fed and they needed to be trained. Listen to this. They were intelligent, but they needed to be trained. Trained what? To be trained the language of the Chaldeans. Listen to these Christian workers working in fields and working in different places. No matter how intelligent you are, if you do not understand the language of the Chaldeans, you will not operate in this world successfully. The language of the Chaldeans are the language that unbelievers speak. The language of the childers are the language of your profession. The language of the childers are the language of your career. That is not me being born again, Holy Ghost, being kids, speaking in fire. No, that, that, that doesn't get you so far. You need to understand. This is somebody, you know what? I can pray myself to any level. I'm a medical doctor, but I don't know what you're talking about. No, it's not like that. 
the language of the child is the language of your profession, the language of your career. You must be trained in that to become what God wants you to become. It's essential. It's important. Are you following what I'm saying? So you can see now, you have some of your own intelligence, and then you get to a place. Then the king said, no, they're intelligent, but I've only chosen them so that they would be able to understand and become teachable the language of the child. But that's not all. And then, this is where we're going. That the king said to the chief eunuch, I'm giving you these guys, four guys plus many more. You need to remember that there were other people. I'm giving you all these people. And he said, with these people, I want you to train them. I want you to feed them. The feeding part is the following one, but we're not, we, you know, I don't want to explore that, but we'll talk about it. I want you to feed them. I want you to train them. And then after some time, they will stand before me. Now, feed them like how? In those days, you don't stand before the king and look sick. You don't stand before the king and look underfed. If you have any form of anorexia, you cannot enter into the presence of the king. It's not possible. You must be ruddy. The Bible pays attention to that. When David was being anointed, the Bible says he looks attractive and ruddy. It's important. It's important. God doesn't deal with all these things you're dealing with. God wants people who are ruddy. I'm telling you the truth. And God wants people who are like that. People who are strong and healthy. Well-fed people in the spirit. And then physically now, the king said they must be fed well. The king's portion. Wow. And then they must be trained. And then this young guy, they were all young. And then this young person, these young people, four of them, Daniel, Meshach, uh, uh, Shed, Meshach, Shedrach, and Abednego, the four of them, they said, we don't want to eat. We don't want the food of the king. We don't want it. And then they used the word that has caused a lot of problems, but I will explain that. They said, we don't want to defile ourselves. With the food. Let me explain what that means. You need to get this clear. The fact that they said they wouldn't defile themselves meant a lot of things. But don't jump to the equation that if they had eaten it, it was a sin. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. This is where the choice really comes in. Now, you are jumping to that because of what I started with. Because we're quick to judge from right, wrong, evil, good. You see, that's the mistake. You're quick to just be simplistic in your judgment. No, it was more than that. It wasn't going to be wrong. There were other Hebrew boys. Not, made, not, not three of them. Not Daniel. There were other Hebrew boys who had the food and they didn't do anything wrong. It wasn't a sin for them to have eaten it. Follow this closely. It wasn't because some of them, that's the only thing they knew. That's the food they gave them. Let me give you an example. That was exactly the same thing that happened to Easter. Easter ate the food. All right now. He started the food. And nothing happened to her. The Bible didn't say because of that she lost her anointing. No, because her sacrifice was in other stuff. That's why you don't come to people of faith. So it, weren't, it wasn't just about that, but there was something here that was deep. They call it a defilement because, listen carefully, they, had, they were expecting something different, they had a different agenda. They wanted something that the king can't give. Not that what the king was going to give was bad, but they wanted something that was different to what the king was going to give them. I'm telling you, courage to produce a different result. So, based on the fact that they were looking for something else, they told themselves, we can afford to take this and produce that result. Let me tell you the simple principle here. You cannot, let's make it easy, you cannot eat rice and vomit pounded yam. That's happened to a lot of people. I remember back then, some people would come to church and say, you know what, what did you eat in a secondary school? What did you have this morning? Oh, my mom gave me bread and egg. Oh, okay, we believe you. And then suddenly, oh, my stomach. Oh, you don't know what <laughs> You're wondering, but your mom gave you. Now, because you see, it's what you put in that is going to come out. It's going to come out. That's how it is. There's nothing you can do about that. And so they wanted to produce a spiritual result. So they had to go on a spiritual journey. Follow this. They wanted a spiritual result. So they had to go a spiritual journey. The input has to be spiritual. The investment has to be spiritual. They cannot follow the physical level and expect to deliver spiritual results. 
So if you're looking for a result that is profound, you must ask yourself, what should be the impute? What do I need to give? It's not a problem if you want to eat the king's portion, but you're going to produce king result. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. But if I know that in my life, with the grace of God and the blessing of God upon my life, I don't want to produce the human king, Queen Elizabeth's result, or pastor's result, or geo's result, or, 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 or general overseer, founder kind of result. If I want to produce the result of God, then I need to ask myself, what is the impute that produces that? What, what, what do I need to give? What do I need to put in? What do I need to invest? How can I produce this kind of result? How can I generate this kind of result? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. How do I speak? Well, except I fresh load my heart with what is good. So how do I generate the kind of result in my life except I have first invested in my spirit? Let me ask, let me tell you this. In any area of life, the only way to produce the results you want is to determine the imputes that you get into it. Let me put it like this. Listen carefully to this. Your power to control your outcome reduces drastically once you commit to the decision. I repeat. Your power to control your outcome reduces drastically once you commit to a decision. Your utmost power to influence your outcome is just before you make the decision. Let me explain what I mean. What I mean is simple. If I want to if I want to go to I want to go to Germany. I want to go to Munich right now. That's where I would like to go. Now, for the plane to take me to Munich, there's something I have to do. I have to decide to buy the flight that is going to Munich. Are you following me? But, for one reason or the other, <laughs> if I bought a flight going to Frankfurt, and for some funny stuff, you find yourself inside the flight going to Frankfurt. Whether you like it or not, you are in Frankfurt. Now, if you say you want to come down from that plane, let me tell you what they will do to you. They will arrest you, put you in custody until the plane lands. And not just that, you will explain why you want to come out. You will prove that you, are, you have not planted a bomb in it. You, you know, it is a long story. So once you get into Frankfurt, you're going to Frankfurt. Your power to control whether you're going to Frankfurt or Munich is before you enter the flight. But most of us get into the flight and expect miracle along the way. And that miracle now means, I want to tell you something now, that miracle you expect along the way now means you expect God to redivert the purpose of the pilot, to redivert the destination of everybody in that flight. No, you enter the wrong flight, you are going to the wrong place, other people in that flight are going to Frankfurt. Because of them, you are landing in Frankfurt. No, you are not getting it. <laughs> you, are not, you see, because we have not been taught responsibility, you, you, you see, you, you're not getting it. You're gonna, you will go to Frankfurt. And that's why people pray and pray and pray and God doesn't do anything because you think God is weak. He doesn't ask out such questions. You know, a funny one is football. The man of God supports Arsenal. Another man of God supports Man United. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want Man United to win. You see, such prayers, God doesn't even intervene. It doesn't concern him because it will become a partial God. So God just says, you know what, at the end of the day, the guy who plays well win. Full stop. You need to understand that. That's what God is going to do because it will become a partial God. He doesn't answer those prayers. Don't believe it. Say because in Nigeria we pray a lot. That's why we want one particular match. Why don't we win every day? No, it's no prayer. Prayer doesn't work in that situation. It's a lie. Because then God will not be God. It will be a partial God. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Get into the right flight. Before you make the decision, pray the prayer. 
for you to change that outcome, please spend time before you commit. Your power to influence your outcome is at its highest before you enter that flight. And that's why, listen to this in making decisions. Nobody will remember you for making a fast decision. People will remember you for making the right one. So if you need to take a little bit of time, do. That's not to suggest that you become indecisive. I'm just saying that within the limits of time that is available to you, don't rush. Because once you commit to it, your power to change the outcome reduces drastically. Am I, am I saying you are not able? Sometimes you're going to be able to change it, but at a serious cost. Because you're going to get to Frankfurt, and then you're going to buy another ticket. And then you're going to waste your time. So it doesn't matter. God is a second, God of the second chance. Oftentimes you pay to get the second chance. Not that God is requesting from you, but you get to buy the flight from Frankfurt. God can make sure that the business you're going to do in Munich will wait for you, but you see, you still have to get there. And buy another ticket. Are you following me? So, quickly before I close, let's go back to Daniel. So Daniel proposed to his heart. This doesn't sound well, this doesn't look well, but I want to do this. I will not defile myself with the king's meat. Listen to this. It takes courage. It's not going to be easy. Some people are going to tell you he's arrogant. Just imagine one young guy goes to the chief owner who's probably like 65 years old and says, sir, uh, I have something to tell you. You know, because of who I am, you know, I, I carry this grace upon my life and this anointing is so heavy. Um, there's no way I would defile myself with the king's meat. Please, sir, I don't want anything. That, that, there's no way to say it that you are not arrogant. There's no humble way to say it. This is the king. You are a slave. You are even privileged to, to be invited. Now you have the audacity to dictate. There's no way to say it. It's arrogant. But God helped him. Because it wasn't arrogance. But people who judge good and evil will call it arrogance. But it wasn't arrogance. He knew exactly what he wanted and where he was going. I want you to be confident in the things that God has spoken to you. Be extremely confident because sometimes there is no good way to explain to people. Be confident in your personal resolutions as long as they are in line with the word of God and they are in line with the spirit of God and that's what God wants you to do. The only time that your principles and your resolutions are bad is if it negates the word of God. You know, I'm not saying whether it's good. It can be very good and negates the plan of God for your life. But if it's aligned with God, that's how to produce a different result. If you want to produce a result that is different, you have to be like Daniel. You have to be like Joshua. You have to be like Caleb. You have to be like someone who's going to do something different. You have to commit yourself to making the right decision at the right time, in respect of what other people are doing around you. The fantastic thing about Daniel and his, this is brethren, it wasn't that the other people were doing it. It was just that, you know what, that's not what I want to do. You need to have such confidence. That's not what I want to do. So, but that's what everybody is doing. That's not what I want to do. That's how everybody is doing it. That's not what I want to do. You must learn to have a personal relationship with God. Don't allow people to push you don't allow people to suggest to you the things to do that looks good to them but doesn't look good to God. To allow people to make you make decisions that is favorable to the human mind and what people think but it's not favorable to your purpose and to your destiny. If you want to produce a different result, you must have this kind of mind that Daniel had. It was tough but then the result was different. Let's quickly fast forward to the result and then we finish there. And then the eunuch said, no, I'm not going to do this because the king is going to kill me. How do I tell the king that it's because I've not been giving you this food? And then you look thin and you look on the fair. And then, and then Daniel, operating with a spirit of faith, told the man, he said, test us for 10 days. Test us for a few days. And if you think what we're saying is fake, then don't worry about it. We'll eat the king's meat. We'll eat it. Well, it's okay. It's, it's okay. 
Because you see, when you believe in God, you don't force things. When you believe in God, you wait for God. It is not by power, nor by mind, but by my spirit, say the Lord. You're not trying to prove a point. You are leaving God to do his work. And when you are at that moment, even if it doesn't work, you don't feel bad. And so they said, all right, test us for a few days and we shall see. And, what, and you make judgment after that. The Bible said that after a few days, the Bible said they look fair and fatter. How can somebody eating vegetables and beans begin to go wild? Becoming fat and the guys were eating the king's meat with the wine and everything with slimmer. I can't explain it. You can't explain it. It's a process of faith. Because God made it happen. And then the, the man said, all right, I think I'll give you vegetables. And so the guy started feeding them vegetables. And at the end of time, the king calls them for the interview. Tell somebody, tell the person, interview is coming. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it, for some of us, interview will be tomorrow when you get to work. Uh, when I mean interview, I don't mean that kind of interview. I mean interview of life. Uh, yeah, so for some of us, it's going to be next week. So for some of us, it's going to be interview, your marital interview. You, 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 the interview will come. Yeah, financial interview, it will come. Relationship interview, it will come. And then after some time, the, 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 the interview time came. And the king called them and interviewed them by himself. And I like it. 